On the face of it, this looks like a straightforward topic. Two men, both Greeks, the Kalia, published in Venice in 1782. One of the Greeks, Nicodemus, a simple monk of the Holy Mountain, born in Naxos in 1749, arriving on the Holy Mountain in 1775 when he was 26, and spending the rest of his life more or less there until his death in 1809 in his, 30th, his 60th year. Declared a saint by the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1955, and added to the Russian Minea in 1956. The other, a teacher, Makarios Notaros, Notaras, born in Corinth in 1731, who taught in the school there until he was elected Bishop of Corinth in 1765, which he had to abandon as a result of the Russo-Turkish War in three years later in 1768. The war over, he found that the Sultan had appointed another Bishop of Corinth, but he was confirmed as a bishop without a see, but with a stipend, by the Ottoman authorities in 1773. He may have sought to become a monk, but the, but the continual or frequent communion controversy raging then on Athos may have discouraged him from settling there when he visited in 1777. On that occasion, he met Nicodemus and their collaboration over various projects, including the Philokalia, began. He spent some years there on that visit and visited Athos again in 1784, but seems to have spent most the rest of his life, dying in 1805, in various islands, Idra, Patros, and especially Chios, where he was sought out as a teacher. He was canonized by popular acclaim shortly after his death. Both men, Nicodemus and Makarios, belonged to revival movements in Greece as the Greeks began to flex their muscles, moving towards the independence, in independence from the Ottoman Empire, which they achieved in 1821, 200 years ago yesterday or perhaps which they began to achieve then. These movements involved emergence, the emergence of a national consciousness, the encouragement of Hellenism through teaching and the establishment of schools, as well as a religious revival, revival which sought to restore authenticity to the practice of orthodoxy, especially orthodox monasticism, which had been damaged during the years from, from 1453 of the, uh, the, sorry, the years from 1453 of the Turkokratia, the Turkish yoke. The Philokalia is a shining beacon of this religious revival, but it doesn't stand alone. With it belongs the publication of the Evietinos, which could be regarded as a kind of precursor of the Philokalia, since it is an 11th century florilegium drawn up by Paul, Bishop of the Evietis Monastery in Constantinople, arranged by topic, florilegium or anth anthology being the meaning of the Greek word um, Philokalia, and a work on frequent or continual communion, which sought to encourage greater frequency in the receiving of Holy Communion, and which, as we have seen, aroused controversy and indeed condemnation by the Ecumenical Patriarch, a hasty act which was soon withdrawn. This religious revival in which Nicodemus and Makarios participated is rightly associated with the Kolivades, so called because they insisted on the observance of the ancient tradition according to which memorial service of the departed with the, the accompanying preparation of koliva, boiled wheat, should properly be celebrated on Saturdays and certainly not on Sundays, which had become the practice and has now crept in again. At the heart of this movement lay an insistence on the recovery of ancient Orthodox tradition. The instance of koliva may seem trivial, but the principle was fundamental and of wider application. Also, although the Kolivades constituted a movement among monks, its implications are much broader, embracing liturgical practice in ordinary parishes. The Philokalia, the Evietis, the Evietinos, and continual communion are all signs of the concerns of this renewal movement, and they are all attributed both to Nicodemus and to Makarios in the sparse evidence that we have None of these works, in fact, name their editors. So far as Nicodemus is concerned, there are other works associated with his name, and sometimes with that of Makarios, notably his Pidalion, the Rudder, a collection with commentary of the holy canons of the Orthodox Church, and a commentary on liturgical canons for the great feasts, the Orthodromion. 
editions of Simeon the New Theologian, Ascription Complex and Not Clear, the correspondence of the sixth century ascetics of Gaza, Varsanufius and John, the works of Gregory Palamas, of which no more than the preface by Nicodemus survives, the rest being destroyed in a raid on a Viennese printer regarded by the Austrian authorities as seditious. Two translations of Western ascetical works, Unseen Warfare, a, translating, a translation of Lorenzo Scupoli's Combattimento Spirituale, and some version of Ignatius Loyola's Spiritual Exercises. The Pedalion and the Orthodromion in particular suggest a wider remit for at least Nicodemus's conception of his endeavors as preparing the Greek church for the freedom that it was seeking as the church of an independent Greece, no longer beholden to the decisions of the Sultan. This wide division is generally accepted. Nicodemus and Macarius's names are associated with others involved in the revival of Hellenism in the 18th century. Names such as Evgenios Vulgaris, Nikiforos Theotokis, Cosmas Aetolas, and, Athan and Athanasios Parios. It is right to see the works of Nicodemus and Macarius in this wider context. And in that context, the notion of deification, the ostensible subject of this paper, might seem to fade into the background. It is indeed not difficult to write a large book on Nicodemus and barely to mention deification. It's been done. And I'm the proud possessor of a copy signed by the author, Dr. George E. Manelos, San Nicodem Laiorite, Maître et Pédagogue de la Nation Grecque et de l'Église Orthodoxe, published in 2002. The title makes clear what is the focus of the book, Nicodemus as master and pedagogue of the Greek nation and the Orthodox Church, probably understood as a hendiadis. Another issue we must mention but cannot solve is the relationship, especially in relation to the Philokalia, of these two men, Nicodemus and Makarios, who was the prime mover. The main evidence we have are the two lives of the saints, Nicodemus's Vita, composed by the Athenais monk Erasmus Mikrianatis of the Skeet of St. Anna, in connection with the saint's canonization in, in 1955, and Macarios's Vita, composed by his friend Athanasius Parios. Given the discrepancy in date, and indeed in closeness to the subject, Parios's narrative is, has markedly higher claims to authenticity than that of the monk Gerasimos. Constantine Kevernos, in his two short works on the saints, which include the Vitae, tends not unreasonably to give more credit to Parios. And this has led to the view which is growing in acceptance that sees Nicodemus more as Macarios's amanuensis, the selection of texts and the whole conception of these works, especially the Philokalia, being credited to Macarios, while Nicodemus is responsible for the important introduction and the brief uh, biographical notes. I think it is also likely that Nicodemus was responsible for the ordering of the texts, something I'll come back to. The article in the soon to be published entry on Macarios in the fourth edition of the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, sees Macarios as the senior partner. There is certainly no question that Macarios was important in the publishing of the Philokalia, and he also seems to have found the sponsor patron who made it possible, John Mavrobodatos. The older view, however, seems to make more of Nicodemus's role. Macarios was certainly the instigator of the project, but the scholar behind it was Nicodemus. My memory, for instance, perhaps not, perhaps not a very reliable source, is that over the years, listening to Metropolitan Callistos talking about the Philokalia, there's been a change from speaking primarily of Nicodemus, so primarily of Nicodemus, to laying more stress on Macarios's involvement, though his article in the Dictionnaire de Spiritualité is quite even handed. This might be of importance for our topic, for Nicodemus seems of the two to be more like a monk committed to hesychasm. 
whereas Makarios was more of a teacher with no secure monastic basis. It could be, I suppose, that Nicodemus's glorification in 1955, in which the Holy Mountain was clearly involved, led to Nicodemus the Hagiorites being put more at the center of the picture. One of the most recent works on Nicodemus also implicitly gives prominence to the monk, namely the article by Elia Ceterio in the second volume, the first to appear, of La Théologie Byzantine et sa Tradition, edited by Carmelo Giuseppe Conticelli and Vassa Conticelli, published in 2002, where the discussion of the, on the, of the Philatalia is part of and appended to the article on Nicodemo Agiorita. It's important to realize that there is a lot of loose ends that cannot be tied up for lack of evidence. One view of the overall history of Orthodox theology over the last two centuries awards to the Philokalia a fundamental role in stimulating an Orthodox approach to theology that came to fruition in the 20th century. My book, Modern Orthodox Thinkers, is an example of such an approach, though a much more significant example of this approach on a more limited canvas is André Scrima's article by Un moine de l'Église orthodoxe de Roumanie, l'avènement philocalique dans l'orthodoxie romaine. But this, the more general view, holds that the philocalia stimulated initially among the 19th century Russians an approach to theology that eschewed the speculative and conceptual and focused on theology as a way of life, to use the fashionable modern phrase which found its fruition in the theologians of the Neobatistic Synthesis, notably Father George Florovsky and Vladimir Lossky, an approach that is not much altered by recent claims that the theologians of the Neobatistic Synthesis, far from breaking away from the religious philosophy of the Slavophils, developed by Solovyov, Florensky and Bulgakov, and others might want to mention late, later figures such as Losiev and Avriensev, owed far more to that tradition than they're willing to admit. A bit. Another point of complication, the place given to the Philokalia by seeing it as lying at the origins of a program of orthodox theology might seem rather different if we were to come to the conclusion that the significance of the Greek Philokalia, whether attributed to Makarios or to Nicodemus, is not as isolated and barmbrescent as this narrative suggests. We're accustomed to regarding the, Slav the Slavonic Dobra to Lubia as a translation, select translation, of the Greek Philokalia. But it is now clear, and has been clear for a long time, if one bothered to look, that the collection and translation of authentic monastic wisdom, of the authentic monastic wisdom of Byzantine monasticism, was independent of whatever it was that Makarios and Nicodemus were up to. And furthermore, that the naming of the Slavonic book Dobrod Lubia, a calc of Greek Philokalia, was not because the Slavonic book itself was no more, or seen as no more, than a select translation from the Philokalia, but a gesture to the authority of the already existing Greek Philokalia, a published work intended to allay St. Pisces' deeply held reservations about publication entailing the putting of his carefully garnered monastic pearls within the reach of a merely curious laity. In truth, the Greek philokalia is one of the fruits of a search for authentic and uncorrupted monastic texts as part of a movement of hesychat renewal associated with the use of the Jesus prayer to attain a practice of unceasing prayer that we can trace back to the circles of the Romanian elder St. Basil of Poyan Marului to which Paisi had attached himself, and which was already underway, certainly before Nicodemus's birth, and maybe even before the birth of Makarios. Whatever the truth of the picture that is emerging, there is a further factor to take into account. In his foreword to the English translation of volume one of Father Dumitru Stanilois Orthodox Dogmatic Theology, called in English, The Experience of God, Metropolitan Callistos remarks, to express this saving dialectic of God's otherness yet nearness, Father Dumitru employs the Palamite distinction in unity 
between God's essence and his uncreated energies. The central place that he assigns to this distinction is a new and significant development so far as works of modern orthodox dogmatic theology are concerned. The Palamite teaching is ignored in the dogmatics of Andruzzos and allowed no more than a passing mention in that of Trembellas. There is no reference to it in the main text of Father Michael Pomazansky's Orthodox Dogmatic Theology, though a few lines are devoted to Gregory Palamas in an appendix. Father Dumitrus is thus the first dogmatics in which the distinction is seen as fundamental to the Orthodox understanding of God. And the distinction, essence, energies, was employed by Palamas, I need hardly tell you, to defend a robust doctrine of theosis or deification. Furthermore, in her recent study, Deification in Russian Religious Thought Between the Revolutions, 1905 to 1917, Ruth, quote, Ruth Coates quotes Ivan Popov, the professor of patristics in the Moscow Spiritual Academy as writing, in 1906, that the idea of deification is completely forgotten in contemporary theology. And thus, despite the fact that in the 19th century, there had been an extensive program of translation of patristic material divided between the spiritual academies. So that as Olivia Claymont remarked, at the end of the 19th century, Russia had at its disposal in its own language, the best patristic library in Europe. All of this might seem a bit surprising for orthodox thinkers whose lives span the watershed of the millennium, for we all speak, perhaps rather too freely, of deification, and close related of the mystical, in our sense, of course, nodding to Vladimir Lossky, not the debased or at least questionable currency that mysticism has in Western thought. There has been a recent book called The Mystical as Political, for instance, 2012, with the subtitle just as baffling. What is even more surprising is that the West seems to be catching up, protesting vigorously that they too have a robust tradition of deification, see especially deification in the Latin patristic tradition edited by Jared Ortiz, a book I find less than convincing. Where does this come from? Is it even for the Orthodox well grounded? So far as Greek patristic thought is concerned, I do not think there's much of a problem, as is demonstrated in, by Norman Russell's now classic work, which is going into a second edition, a uh, revised edition, The Doctrine of Deification in Greek Patristic Thought, 2005. But what about the Philokalia narrative about deification? There are, in what I've been suggesting, considerations that pull in different directions. <clears throat> Seeing the Philokalia as part of a movement of hesychast monastic renewal, in which the Jesus prayer and the institution of the elder Stariots play an important part, seems to me to draw attention to a very significant tradition in modern Orthodox theology, which has been productive of some of the profoundest monastic wisdom we are ever likely to see. I'm thinking particularly of the works of Father Vasilios, once at Stavron Akita, more recently at Eviron, and the late Father Emilianos of Simonopetra, to mention just two. Monastic wisdom, which seems to have resonance well into orthodox thought of a more academic vein. This is theology as a way of life, in which deification has a central part. But if we take up the more recent suggestion, as it seems to me, that we should see the real inspiration behind the Philokalia as Macarius, one time Bishop of Corinth. I'm not so sure how confident we can be that deification really sums up at all what lies at the heart of this enterprise. What the Philokalia offers could be regarded as an initiation into a course of monastic reading that ensures that the monk makes contact with a broad and historically well so wide ranging form of monastic Hellenic monastic wisdom. It is, after all, a philokalia, that is, an anthology of diverse texts, 
and therefore can be read from various perspectives. It ends, certainly, with a group of texts associated with the 14th century, with 14th century Hesychasm, defending the claims of the Hesychast monks to see truly in their prayer, decide the claims of the Hesychast monks to see truly in their prayer, the uncreated light of the Godhead, and not just see, but in seeing to be transformed and transfigured into God. And the place of the Jesus prayer in all this is clearly set out in these treaties gathered towards, gathered together towards the end of the Philokalia. But I think it'd be unwise to think that the Philokalia should be regarded as determined by its concluding treatises. There's a good deal in the volume that might seem to have much less to do with hesychasm than in, in its narrower 14th century connotation. There's a good deal of uncompromising intellectual theology. Some of the works included by St Maximus and also St Gregory Palamas, for instance. And it is striking that these works are not included in the Slavonic version, by which I do not mean excluded, given what I think is the relation between the Philokalea and the Drobosh Lubia, cousins, as it were, rather than mother and daughter. There's another reason for hesitating about giving too much or even any weight to the fact that the, the hesychast density is more marked towards the end of the Philokalea, as if this were the culmination of the work. For the principle of selection in the Philokalea is clearly chronological, which suggests anyway that the selection is by is down to Nicodemus, who, as John Erickson showed in the context of the Pidalion, had imbibed modern Western scholarly principles, which since the Renaissance had made ad fontes a driving principle. Nevertheless, the Philokalea has and the Greek Philokalia has an introduction, Proemion, Eastin Parousdan Vivlon, which is generally accepted to be by Nicodemus. And this, if anything, should give us the answer, or at least an answer, to the question of the purpose of the Philokalia. Indeed, it does, very clearly, in its opening words and thereafter. Its opening words are actually a prayer. God, blessed nature, perfection beyond being, principle beyond the good and beautiful, so be, principle beyond the good and the beautiful, creating everything good and beautiful. From eternity you determined in accordance with your divine plan to deify humanity. Nicodemus goes on to relate this to the doctrine of the human as created in the image of God and alludes to St. Gregory of the Theologian's famous picture of the human as a kind of world in little, great in multitude and preeminence of its faculties. Among these faculties or powers, xenomis, was freedom, for which reason, and I quote again, as Ben Syrac says, God left man to his own devices to choose to do whatever he was resolved on with the prize that if he kept the command he had received, he'd obtain the genuine grace of deification, becoming God and blazing forever with the purest light. And the economist continues with an account of the fall and human restoration through the incarnation made accessible through baptism, all along relating this to the final goal of deification. The final goal ultimately to bear fruit and to become by grace children of God and to be deified having attained to perfect manhood unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And this was, in short, the whole end and purpose of the economy of the word concerning us. The infallible way of laying hold on what the incarnate word has secured for us is through the Jesus prayer. To pray without ceasing to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not simply, I say, in our mind or only with our lips, for verbal prayer is obvious to all who choose, to cho 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 choose to worship God and easy for the one who tries it. And he goes on to talk about the kind of books that might help us to such purifying, illuminating and perfecting activity to speak like the Areopagite, as he says, referring back actually to the first, the title page of the Philokalia. Um, there's a bit here that I'm going to going, basically, basically going to omit. It's, it's there in the book, as it were. Um, um, 
But there's quite a what the way Nicodemus treats deification is something that re requires a little more thought than I've been able to give it. One thing he does point he does make though, and he makes this very strongly, is that these works that people need in order to fight to in order to to pursue this this project of deification through the Jesus prayer. These works have all but vanished. Some have never been printed. And the few that somehow survive, they are moth-eaten and in a state of decay and call to mind about as much as if they had never existed. And for this reason, and this is the explanation he gives of the, the carelessness of the monks about what is clearly, what is their task. Um, they are, as it were, troubled about many things, as he says, that is bodily matters and the practice of virtues. But as for the one thing, clearly, guarding the intellect and pure prayer. I do not understand how they stupidly neglect it. He comes back to this a bit later on um, when he talks about these writings. For behold, writings never ever published in earlier times. Behold, works which lay about in corners and holes of darkness, unknown and moth-eaten, and here and there cast aside in a state of decay. Behold texts conducive to purification of the heart, watchfulness of the intellect and the dwelling in us of grace. And in addition, scientifically guiding us to deification. He sounds a bit like Pselos talking about the way in which he, sort of, he, 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 he um, discovered all the great works of Neoplatonic wisdom, which nobody else knew anything about in his day. This is what Nicodemus sees himself as making available, not so much the continuing of a tradition of monastic wisdom as rescuing it from neglect and final extinction. This, however, only leads us towards a final problem. This is the introduction to the Greek for the Kalia. It's the introduction that tells us all this. I think you can get you. I don't think you you could derive it so clearly if what you had was just the rest. But the introduction to the Greek philokalia um, is only part of the Greek philokalia, which seems to have had little impact in the century that followed. The second Greek edition was only published more than a century later, in 1893, and the third edition not until 1957 to 63. The 19th century was a period of political and, and social turmoil for the Greeks. Perhaps that's the explanation. Nicodemus's translation was not translated into Slavonic or Russian, so far as I know. So the impact of the Philokalia, or more properly of the Dobrosh Lyubia, was deprived of the clarity of purpose found in this introduction. But the influence of the Dobrosh Lyubia a more strictly ascetic volume than the, than the Greek Philokalia is really its own story. I think we call it Philokalic out of laziness. It's really a story which, is, which belongs to the Slav world. And we should probably recognize that far and away the greatest impact of, Philokalic, of the Philok Philokalic program of the Jesus prayer to achieve unceasing prayer is down to a book known in English as the way of a pilgrim which works its power by appeal to the imagination rather than by anything more specifically theological. Furthermore, as Ruth Coates and other recent scholars have shown, the Philokalic story is only part of the, the story of the origins of the notion of deification or Vosgenia in the tradition of, Greek thought, of Russian thought. Its roots also lie in strands of theology indebted to German idealism, and indeed to German theologians who had absorbed these influences. Jeremy Pilch, for instance, in his recent book, which I forgot to note here, um, has shown how Solovyov's notion of Bogoceloviec, the God-man, could well have its roots in Dorner's Lera de Person Christi, a work that he knew well, and where Dorner talks about, makes central to his account of patristic Christology, the notion of the Gottmensch. Solovio's notion of Vyelechel Vecestvo is part of what he means by obozhenia. Just as interesting is, is just as interesting is Pilch's demonstration that Solovyov was well read in contemporary Catholic theology and made a convincing explanation 
of the meaning of orthodox deification in terms of current Catholic of the current of the current Catholic theology of grace. All of which suggests that the history of orthodox theology cannot be considered in isolation from the wider the theological discourse then or now. So what is my conclusion from all this? What's my conclusion from all this? I'm tempted to say this, an overarching account of orthodox theology over the last two centuries, beginning with the philokalia and seeing mostly 20th century orthodox theology as profoundly bound up with the vision of this work is convenient, but is only part of the story. Maybe not even the most important part epexegetic rather than causal, as one might say. It has the advantage of seeing the arc traced by orthodox theology in pretty well exclusively orthodox terms, but that however seems to me not an unqualified advantage. It has nevertheless been what many orthodox have wanted to believe, from the Russian exiles who tried to make sense of their uprooted state as a result of the Bolshevik revolution and their loss of Holy Russia, by seeing orthodoxy as a treasure it was their duty to preserve, and in some cases share with the Christians of the West who would welcome them. To others like Christos Yanaras, much inspired by his experience of Russian Orthodox life in Paris, who see orthodoxy as the answer to the cultural and philosophical crisis of Western thought, now undermining with its baleful influence, the values of traditional Orthodox society and culture. At best, the philokalic, the philokalic vision and its tradition is only part of the story of modern orthodoxy, and in particular, only part of the development of modern orthodox theology of the doctrine of deification. It is probably not even a determinative factor in that development. There are other factors more important. Ruth Coates' book, for instance, finds at least four areas that contribute to the appeal of deification in Russian theology in the period immediately before the October Revolution, some of which highlight the way in which even self-consciously orthodox thought proceeded by way of dialogue with decidedly Western developments, and others of which draw on aspects of orthodox consciousness, for example, its fondness for some aspect of theocracy that cannot be taken on board without some careful scrutiny. As one of Oscar Wilde's characters said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Thank you.